And welcome to this very first uh, Working Smarter Not Harder group session. I think the, the key here is really this is this is your, if you like, sub-community on the tribe. And the whole idea about the tribe is that we are a community of people that come together. We have similarities, we have differences, we have ideas, uh, things we want to share, there's things that we also want to learn. And within the community, obviously, each of the faculty leads myself included, have kind of focused on a certain area. And, and I've, I've chosen this Working Smarter. It's going to be regularly uh, this time each week. If there's any time I can't make the call, then one or two things will happen. Either I will have one of the other faculty leads step in for me and give you a, a different, uh, different viewpoint, which is going to be good. Or if uh, that doesn't work out um, due to availability, etc., then I will do a short sort of recorded message that you can find on the group. But the plan is that week after week we will have a conversation. Um, each week it'll be a similar format in the sense that they, you know, I'm just going to put something out there, two or three ideas maybe, something to kick it off, etc., and then we'll move into a, an open discussion or an open conversation. Most of the call is going to be like that. Uh, now it may well be as we progress, then certainly um, you know we might have some running conversations that need to go from week to week, and that will that will form the shape of what we talk about in the following week. That would be fantastic, and you know I'd love it if uh, you know after we finish this session that in the group forum itself that you throw up some ideas or some questions, some challenges that we can talk about during the week um, through the forum, but also kind of gives me some ideas of what it is we should focus on in the coming week as well. Though I thought it would be useful for this one um, to just go back to where it all kind of started for me. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I think most of you do know me, but for anybody who listens to this recording perhaps and doesn't know me, um, I'm probably best known as the Lazy Project Manager because I wrote a book uh, just over 10 years ago now called The Lazy Project Manager, which at the time was a, a little bit of fun. It was something I was had an opportunity to do. I managed to get a, a publisher who kind of liked the crazy title. Uh, and I didn't think too much more about it than, well, that's me sharing some ideas um, to the world. And I don't know, maybe a few hundred people will read it. Who knows? But uh, a few thousand people have read, have read it over the years. And it still sells. And it's still in the uh, some of the book charts right now. Um, which is amazing, and so you know, uh, my my primary location apart from the tribe is thelazyprojectmanager.com, where there's more information about me. Um, you can find me on Twitter as the Lazy PM, and and I love to be connected to on LinkedIn, so it's um, easy to find there as well. But I was very excited when when Rick came to me and talked about the PM tribe because, uh, you know, I. I, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with some of the big communities of project managers out there. Um, I think they're all good. I think they do some great stuff. But they're all a little bit slow sometimes to talk about things that matter right now. And I think the tribe is something that gives us that opportunity to have in-the-moment conversations, which right now is a, is a very good thing. This was the quote that kicked everything off to me, and I'm, sort of, I'm going back to some of the, you know, the, the basics that triggered the writing of the Lazy Project Manager, because the Lazy Project Manager is about project management, but it's also about managing yourself whilst you're managing projects, so that's one of the best descriptions I've had of people sharing it. And this, this is kind of the quote. I mean, the, the quick version of the story is that at this particular time, I had moved away, away from direct project management, and I was now heading up a PMO, for a, uh, a software company, and uh, I noticed I had about a hundred or so project managers working for the PMO, and it, it was interesting. I noticed half of them were working very effectively to a, to a reasonable level. Don't you know? I'm not saying they were perfect or anything like that, but they were being reasonably successful, and they were putting in, on average, a fairly typical working week. Now we know projects go up and down. We know there is no flatness to uh, to projects. There are times you're really busy, and sometimes that you're incredibly really busy. But on average, let's say they were working a typical working week, and they were being reasonably successful. What I noticed about the other half, broadly speaking, of, of the community of project managers was that they were they were working some crazy hours, 60, 70, 80 hours a week sometimes. Just just really heavy loads of work. And the interesting thing was they were they were being no more successful than the uh, the previous group, uh, who were working you know, fairly typical working weeks on average. So 
I started doing some sort of looking into, I mean, research is a, quite a strong word, really. I, you know, I, I started doing some analysis, if we say. What is it they were doing differently between those two groups, and why were some being just as effective with less effort, and some people were being just as effective with a lot more effort? And that was driving my mind when I, I, I came across this quote, and my manager managed, uh, managed to insult me as far as I was concerned, because he called me one of the laziest people he's ever met. But he actually meant it in a, in a good way. It took me a while to come to terms with that. But then I found this quote by Robert Heinlein, the science fiction writer, which is, progress isn't made by early risers. It's made by lazy men, lazy people. Obviously, this was a quote from some time ago. Lazy people trying to find easier ways to do something. And I thought, you know what? That that is it. It is, it is finding this effective way of working. It's about, it's about working smarter and not harder. And when I when I lecture about this, when I run workshops about this, or master classes, um, I think it's, I think workshop or master card. It's interesting. It's more more down to the branding, I think, of what people want to uh, promote it as and what to, what the fee charge for it is. But when I have these sessions. I typically kick off with this kind of uh, talk about the Pareto Principle, which was suggested by uh, Joseph M. Duran. But it was actually named after the Italian economist Alfredo Pareto. And he did this observation uh, many, many years ago that 80% of the property in Italy was owned by 20% of the Italian population. Now, the 80-20 rule, uh, we all know that. We quote it probably on a very regular basis. And it works, you know, typically an organization, most of the organizations I've worked for, 80% of the revenue comes from just 20% of the products that they sell. Um, uh, you know, in our personal life, we wear 80% of the clothes that we wear 20% of the time. I'm actually, in lockdown, that's probably even worse. You know, we're, uh, we're stuck at home and we're looking, you know, it's very casual and probably reusing a lot of clothes that we uh, may not wear as much normally. But the 80-20 rule, it works. And so... When I talk about being uh, productively lazy, which is a term that I came up with, you know, not negative lazy, not bad lazy, not doing nothing lazy, but being productively lazy, what I, what I meant by that is that you find ways to be effective in the right area. So if you think about this, 20% of the effort that you put in actually delivers 80% of the value of what you put in. 20% delivers 80% of the return on investment, return on personal investment. And it's a lot of it is about finding the right way of prioritizing. You know, what is the I should be working on? You know, what is the, what is the important things I should be working on? What is the impact of, of doing these things? You know, those kind of two things together, those two things factored together, it allows us to, to do a, a, a better prioritization of what we should be doing. We we all have to do lists. We all have things we have to do, you know. And you know, at any given time, people are sending you emails or messages or leaving you phone calls, etc., or asking you to do something. Your to-do list constantly grows. But if we just start at the oldest one and start working our way through, it may not necessary. Almost certainly won't be the most important uh, thing we should be doing. So. I always tell people this, you, know, you need to reflect upon this, and I think this is a great thing that you can talk about, and how you can go about doing this, how can you, how can you prioritize in the right way? Because if you do that, if you find out well, what is it I should be working on and get it done, then actually it's very empowering for two reasons. It's empowering because you feel, you feel positive because you've achieved something. And secondly, it's empowering because it allows other people to get on with their work. Often you, particularly as a, as a project leader, as a project manager, as a project director, or a PMO head, or whatever your role is, you are part of the controlling factor of, of other people's work, as other people are on you, of course. You know, we don't just go into work and just do exactly what we want to do and don't worry about anybody else. That's not how life works, obviously. You have commitments, you have promises made, you have deadlines to meet, etc. But in the area of flexibility about what I should be working on tomorrow, first thing, tomorrow, second thing, and so forth, then I encourage people to think, you know, oh, you know, last thing at night on the way, well, <laughs> on the way, I was going to say on the way to work, but not many of us are probably going on the way to work, but over that first cup of coffee that you have in the morning, what is it you should be doing? And, and do a little prioritization. Try and understand what, what, is, what is in that 20% that you need to do that is really going to deliver a huge personal uh, in return on investment. The 80, it will deliver the 80% of progress. 
And the last thing I want to cover is this one. This is the the intelligence of laziness, as I talk about it in my keynotes. It, it's some work that Helmut Karl and Berhard Graf von Moltke did. Moltke was the field marshal of the Prussian army at the end of the 19th century. And he he analysed his troops. He and his, his son after him actually created a very efficient military force in Prussia. Very efficient, very organised, and, and uh, you know, a lot of what they did is still prevalent in the, in the modern military forces around the world. But one of the things that I just love was Moltke. He, they, he looked at his troops, his his uh, the people in his army basically, and said, "Well, look, people are, are you know simply it's categorised in the following ways. They are either not very smart or they are smart." Well, they're either lazy or they're diligent. So he didn't actually say not smart. He was being a lot ruder than that. But you get the idea. Um, so you're either not very smart or smart. You're either lazy or diligent, hardworking, busy. And he categorized people <clears throat> in this way. And he said, well, one group of people, they are the sort of the lazy but not the most intelligent people. You know, they, they let them be quiet. They may come up with a, a great idea one day. They're mostly harmless. He didn't really have too much time for these people. They were just in in the in the army, and they they did a job for sure. I mean, I suspect that these people were perhaps slightly nearer the front line when the Prussian army went into battle, because they could be seen as um, you know disposable in that sense, um, you know, a cannon fodder or something like that. Not very nice, but you know, Malka didn't have a problem with them. He said, well, "Let them be quiet. They might come up with a good idea one day. They're harmless." Malka did have a problem with the not very smart people who are busy, hardworking, diligent, always at something, always thinking about something. And Malka said, look, you need to take these people out. They tend to keep the organization busy with really silly stuff. It's very distracting. And it's always fun, you know, when I have a, uh, a big group, we kind of say, well, you know, do you know anybody like this? Can you look at them right now? Are they sitting next to you? And you get a lot of laughs for that one. But yeah, Malka's view was these, these people are destructive and they are distracting and they need to be dealt with in some way. Again, in the Prussian army at the end of the 19th century, that probably wasn't a very nice way, but let's move on. If we move on to the right-hand side, which is the, really the heart of this, Imalka said, look, <clears throat> the people who are hard-working and intelligent, in his terms, deploy into a staff function. They will make sure all detail is thoughtfully addressed. Now, that's a great thing, and you need people like that, absolutely. absolutely. But Malka did not consider these people as your leaders. You know, these are not the people who are leading his troops. In, in real life, these are not the people who are best suited to lead project teams or program teams or PMOs even. Malka said, look, if you find the people who have this combination between lazy and smart, promote these to your leadership because they will know how to be successful through the most efficient deployment of resources. They will know how to work smarter and not harder. And that that really is is at the heart of this. It's all about finding the most efficient way to do things. And, you know, in the coming weeks, it, it does depend. It does depend where we get to go with this. In in the coming weeks, um, you know, I, would, I want to take the conversation, or I can take the conversation in a certain direction. And there's, there's two books I've written, uh, The you know, Lazy Project Manager and The Lazy Winner. And there's lots of you know, insights and thoughts and stimulations, stimulations that we can look at and discuss in those books. And I'm happy to take us on that journey in, you know, over the next you know, probably six to eight weeks. Or, actually, you can come back to me and go, you know what, I want to talk about this. Or, you know, how about this? Or, this has happened to me. So, you know, what I'd like at the end of this session and I'm going to shortly open this up to, to our com you know, open conversation. You know, I'd like you to walk away with some inspiration after each session. That's, that's what I'd love to happen. You go, well, that's an interesting idea. That would be great. I might try that or whatever. And it might not come from me. Um, as we progress, almost certainly it won't come from me. It's going to come from other people joining in these group sessions. I'd love you to, to you know, you've got a few people on right now. So, you know, you could reach out and, and make a friend inside the the, the tribe um, website, if you go to members, you can search uh, for uh, members, you can find people, you can see who's in the group or whichever group you join. You know, you can make a friend on the tribe and you can make a friend outside the tribe as well. Uh, I think this would be really good. And I'd love you to come back with an idea and challenge. I mean, I could sit here you know, week after week and I could just talk for 15, 20 minutes. I, I have no problem with that, but it may not be the most exciting or interesting thing. 
Um, and actually, from my point of view, if you come back with an idea or a challenge that really makes me do some thinking, some working, some preparation, that's 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 a really good thing for me as well. So, I think this is very exciting. I think um, I have an idea where, where this will go. As I said, I have an idea of a path that we could follow, but actually, you lead the way, and it will be your conversations and your issues and your ideas and your challenges and your suggestions that will actually decide where we actually go on this one. Okay, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. As I said, there is a Q&A um, tool we can use, um, and the way it works is if I turn this, I switch to it, I click a switch, and it, we turn into Q&A, and you basically click on your screen when you want something to say. There are 14 people here, including myself, so let's see if this works as just an open conversation, open dialogue at this point in time. Um, I'm sure we're all going to be very respectful of each other. Um, that was my introduction. Um, thoughts, questions, conversations? Who, who'd like to go first and, and start this, uh, this whole discussion going? Don't be shy. Peter, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. All right, so since it's, uh, it's always... Uh-oh, another, it's another faculty member who's going to come on and heck, heckle me. Oh, no, heck no. Um, <laughs> it's always hardest to get the first person to say something. I'm just going to... Oh, it is, it is. So when you, when you do come in, and obviously I know you, John, obviously, but you know, when you do come in, please you know, introduce yourself to everybody else. We're all beginning to get to know each other. Um, and yeah, let's just say, you know, say hi. Okay, so I'm John Stenbeck. I'm having a cup of coffee. Nothing in it because it's only 10 o'clock in the morning here. Um, <clears throat> that being said, I, I love your opening. It took me back. My dad was a billion, with a B, billion dollar successful entrepreneur. And, and he used to regularly quote the Pareto Principle. And he used to regularly say, when I'm trying to make an operation go big and go fast, I look for the laziest guy I can find. So. Uh, I think you're in very good company in your thinking because uh, m my dad proved lifelong so successful in multiple ventures um, that being intelligently lazy, or I forget the phrase exactly used, but there Productive, was... Productively lazy. That's yeah, the, that's the... I'm stealing that. That was really good. So thank <laughs> you for that tidbit. I that's okay. It's, it's trademark. Don't worry. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect, oh, perfect. And I'm, I'm only about a billion dollars behind your dad. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> my, my dad used to say, you know, he's working on the second billion because the first one's too hard to get. Uh, I'm sure Greg uh, and John or Michael have something better to say. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, John. Anybody else? You know, I, I guess, uh, I'm sorry, I'm John from Columbia. I guess my thinking is lazy is such a negative term. Was that just to get attention, or uh, why did you come up with that word instead of some other some other word? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, it was it was because I was called lazy by someone and saw it as a positive thing. I was trying to find something to describe what I was doing. You know, analyzing those project managers, lazy project manager kind of seen to roll off the tongue quite nicely and it was a little bit about insult your profession and, and get on in life it was um, it was provocative well I've you know I've talked to a few people about this it's you know it has worked it has worked in most parts of the world but it hasn't gone down well in some of the Asian countries they can't get past the negativity of the word lazy um, and I've also worked in the Middle East and in those cases you know I can't I, I have to rebrand effectively what I'm talking about because that doesn't go down well either so it hasn't always worked um, it doesn't seem to have stopped me too much um, and as I said the book is, is still selling but I think it's you know it was it just tried to encapsulate the idea of the fact that you know, we all work an awful lot. We all work pretty hard, and I did. I mean, the the the, back, the other background story to this is, in my early days as a project manager, I ran a project for nearly three years. It was a huge project, um, multi sites across uh, Europe. And at the end of it, because it was the you know by far the biggest thing I've ever been given, it was the biggest project my company at that time had ever had by a factor of four. And I threw myself at this and. You know, I was I was reasonably successful, but it consumed my life. I was working ridiculous hours. I was, you know, I was making sure that I 
was in, in every meeting, every decision point. I didn't trust anybody. I, you know, I was micromanaging everywhere, and it was burning. It burnt me out. Um, I was working on holidays. I had one cancelled holiday. Uh, I can remember being on one like holiday where I had to go off and find an internet cafe to, to follow up on some actions, etc. And I was physically ill on more than one occasion during during the project. And at the end of it, I kind of I was just a, I had a dilemma. I was like, well. I I kind of love this life. I you know I enjoy this this leading change, but equally I looked at it and thought, well I can't I can't do this for the next twenty thirty years. It will it will kill me. So what am I doing wrong? And I you know with the, with the help of a couple of of mentors at that time, we began to unpick kind of way I was working, and I realised you know I wasn't work I wasn't using my team properly. I wasn't delegating. I wasn't um, you know, managing my own time properly. Um, I was I was. Bad, I was communicating in a bad way. There was lots of things. That really is at the heart of the lazy project manager. So, you know, lazy, not everybody likes it perhaps, but it, it seems to have done the trick of making it interesting for people, yeah, attracting audiences, attracting readers, and getting, and getting attention, the kind of subject needed really, as far as I'm concerned. How do you take it, John? I mean, what was your, what was your thought on, on, the, on that term? Do you see it as a negative? Uh, no, I mean, uh, I, I, I see the word as a negative, but not in that context. You know, right. I, I guess, I, and maybe my age will come through on this, but, you know, I was thinking generationally, uh, you know, if you look at people today versus uh, olden times with it, you know, hard work uh, was the way to get anything and to be successful like you described. Uh, with it, the one that worked the harder were often the ones that that succeeded and got promoted and stuff. And you know, I guess I see uh, kind of a, a shift in a lot of that now as people seek for more home home work balance with it. So you know, that was kind of along the lines I was thinking about is is uh, the way we works kind of kind of different than the way uh, my parents worked and I worked early days. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, maybe I should, maybe I should bring out a third edition, which is the the lazy millennial project manager. I mean, because they just uh, they're kind of attuned to that way of working from the start. It seems. <laughs> hey. is, that, is that is is that uh, uh, same word for twice? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, I don't know. Do, do anybody, we... but. <laughs> do we do we have any millennials on the call? I'm not sure we I'm not sure we necessarily do. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else on the call? Any other thoughts? Oh, you're a shy bunch. Go on, you're a shy bunch. Hello. It's Michael Flint. Michael. Hi. Um, project manager has been do has done forty to fifty years of project management. Uh, more retired now than anything, but um, when you brought your book out, I I think I went after you as well. I said I I should have written this book, not you. <laughs> it related exactly to how we do things, or I I've been doing things all my life. Is basically. I try and find the easiest way to get things done. And I work hard at trying to find that easy way. So you called me lazy, and, I, and, that, and that's okay. It's right. Because I want to be able to sit back and watch the work get done mm -hmm. without having to be into everything for, for the, you know, every second of the route. I do not want to be a micromanager. So it was... It was very enlightening when you brought the book out, and uh, I seriously uh, recognised myself throughout your chapters. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I do, for those who haven't read, really, you know, I joke about in the middle of the project. You know, basically at the front end, there's a lot of work. At the end, there's a lot of work. But actually, in the middle, the the, you know, the project manager should have a nice, comfy chair because, you know, the real work is being done by the project team during this particular phase. It is about structuring the project correctly and 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 having the right sort of de approach to leadership at that point in time. But not, you know, not remote, not being distant, not being uh, aloof or anything like that but to be proactively and reactively involved as needed. So, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So, so if I can jump back in this, John Stanwick yeah. again. I, I, Michael, I thought your, your observation was spot on. I'm curious both from you and from Peter how you guys see this 
kind of aligning with um, lean principles? Because I, I, I personally think it does. I'm just curious if you guys see that same thing and, and what aspects of it you see. Yeah, I mean, Michael, do you want to comment on that? Um, I, yeah, I, I have to think about that one. Uh, the, yeah, the, the lean side of things, the Six Sigma types of things that are brought into play. Like, I've got so many tools in this toolbox that they, I think they all have something to do with each other. And it's which of these tools works best in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. You know, would I use Lean on every project? No. Uh, would I use it on this project because it's you know it's more f focused on uh, process and everything else? Yeah, probably. So it, it's it's still. I think we're going back to the. It's a, a philosophy. How can I get this done without killing myself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I, yeah, we look for the tool that makes it easier for us. Because uh, my my tagline, which if if you ever see a book written by me, it's going to be, uh, if this was easy, somebody else would be doing it. <laughs> and and that, and that adds to the same sort of flavor. It's. We're looking for how to get to end of job, doing what the customer is asking for, the client's asking for, meeting the requirements without actually, yeah, I'll say it again, killing yourself. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, and, well and certainly. You're the one on the ball. You're, you're, you're the one that's going to be responsible. If, if this doesn't work, it's your fault. <laughs> but you have to be very clever at getting past that uh, level. So, and, and I, I kind of think, think I kind of think right. Your point, John. There. Yeah. The the way lean stresses, you know, the value of work not done by eliminating obstacles to flow, eliminating features that the customer didn't want or didn't ask for. Right. That's that's productively lazy. Correct. Don't go blade it. Don't insert stuff they didn't ask for. Don't you know. Don't just randomly expand the task load for your team or your project, you know. So, yeah, and I and I said yep. lean principles, and I should have said figuratively, I guess, more than <laughs> yeah. literally. I didn't I didn't phrase the question very good. Yeah. Now we've certainly in mean, the last couple of companies, last couple of PMOs I've you know set up, and we've been looking at our methodology. We incorporate every aspect of it, you know, to, to make it as efficient as possible. I mean, Gerald makes a comment about, you know, maybe maybe efficient would be the Asia-friendly version of productively lazy, and you're right, it is another term for that. Um, and you know, we embedded uh, you know components of lean, components of agile um, within the methodology, and you know, it all it all really really worked, etc. Somebody else, somebody else from the, the group, some other comment. Daniela, your your name has just popped up on my screen. Is that because you were to talk to us? Or not? No? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm going to force you, I I'm going to force you, but you, you, your name's there. Like, hello, how are you? Uh, fine, thanks. <laughs> Uh, tell people where you're from. Tell people where you're from. Uh, I'm from Romania, from Bucharest. Uh, yeah. So um, I would uh, like uh, to add uh, that it's not important the methodology, uh, not important that we apply PMI waterfall or uh, Agile or uh, PRINCE2 or other methodology of project management. Uh, it's important to be efficient. It's important to respect and to provide uh, what the client needs and uh, mm -hmm. on time <laughs> to be uh, lazy as a project manager. Manager, And for this, you have to empower uh, your team because uh, they are specialists in their fields. You, a project manager is not. And uh, they have, they know uh, better than uh, the project manager how to do it, uh, to do their job, um, and uh, to 
support you as a project manager to get things done uh, as lazy as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, okay. You do, and uh, you know I do have a. There's, there's a great story about this. One of my my most terrifying flights was to, to go in and uh, do some work with Danielle. Reed. <laughs> <laughs> we're, but the worst possible storm where we took 40 minutes to attempt to land the plane and I was going to deliver the Project From Hell workshop. It was uh, yeah, interesting to Yeah, and I, and I called, uh, and I called uh, <laughs> immediately uh, Lavinia at that time. Yeah, oh yeah. Lavinia, all, all, all of the things are okay <laughs> with you and with Peter. Uh, I remember. Yes. Yeah, nobody wants to, three attempted landings to actually bring that plane. I think I was one of the last planes to actually land that night before the big storm hit. So, uh, yeah, good, well, memories, <laughs> good memories of landing, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, so Grace, you, you totally agree with the 80-20 model, uh, working smarter, uh, it makes people identifying priorities, most efficient, effective, less stressful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, does anybody have an ex an example of this? Or do you have an, an experience they want to share? I know it's scary at the moment. It's like if we're just sitting in a room with a cup of coffee or a glass of wine and just having a chat, it'd be a lot easier. I know that. <laughs> okay, let me say something. At least with the things going on right now, I, yeah. think, um, I had to put on my project management hat with the homeschooling we are doing right now. So having to put t take kids through schooling at home is a whole project on its own. From having to put your schedules together and ensure that everything is going on and still get your work done. So um, when I think about working smarter, I think about the fact that it's not only about having the processes, but also having a contagious energy and enthusiasm to ensure that every other person is influenced to work at a pace and with the energy of not having to get to that point where you're having negative ripple effect of negative energy, which on its own is, is stressful as it is. I don't know if I'm... Yep, no, 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 you're right. Yeah, so absolutely. And, and, you know, we're... About um, working smarter is really mm -hmm. not just about the work. But it's also how it affects you as a person, how it affects your team. How do you ensure that everybody feels we are achieving this in the best way possible while staying healthy, while reducing the stress on ourselves and delivering the best that we can to the clients or to the organization. So it's still a mindset that, okay, you wake up early in the morning, tell yourself, Give yourself a positive mindset. Ask yourself, what are my priorities for today? How do I achieve them in the least stressful way? And also, mm -hmm. how do I influence others to, add, to be able to work with me to the point that we are all finishing the day, still feeling energetic and restful from an accomplished day? Yeah, well, I certainly agree. I mean, and yes, you're right. I mean, I talk about working smarter, not harder, but it's just, it is being smarter. Uh, and not making things difficult for yourself. It is about that. You know, if you create that, I think, approach, then those around you uh, do the same. It's you know, I think you do become incredibly uh, productive, and it's it's almost like you've created a, if not a team, a community of, of, of people with the right attitude. True, because even I've seen that in my nine-year-old son when he's working, especially on his math, and you tell he's feeling low. And you get him to mm -hmm. the point of make, be feeling excited about his doing, what he's doing, and you'll see the creativity that comes up, and pam, 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 he's done, and he's telling you other ways that he could even make it faster. <laughs> so this also yes. can happen to us as adults. And at the end of the day, we are working smarter and not harder. Yep. Absolutely, I agree. And, okay. and the reflection on the current situation, because I've obviously been having a number of calls with people, it's... Yeah, I've always had the the the, the attitude of um, you, you can you can have, you can be productive and have some fun, have some smiles as well. But it's interesting watching the trappings of formality disappearing. Now I was on a call uh, earlier today, and the, they're a professional couple. And at this point, I mean, and the, the lady I was talking to, her husband was having some very challenging and difficult 
work conversations. I, I didn't ask what it was about. It, you know, she, she kind of intimated it was quite serious, and it may be involving people's working jobs, etc. I don't know. But uh, you know, he, he had at that point they're locked down at home. He's had to focus absolutely, and she's now she's now in charge of the three children that range from three to seven, whilst also trying to run her own company and have calls, etc. But you know, their kid, you know, her kids were just, they were all over the place in the school. They were, <laughs> they were being kids, etc. And, uh, you know, but it didn't stop the call being a good call. And we got, you know, we got to the point quite quickly. We had a couple of laughs about what was going on because you know, it seemed, they seemed to be taking turns to actually hurt themselves during the short call, the children. Um, but it seems to me, and I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, if you're continuing to work at this point in time, is... All that kind of formality that we used to have in meetings is, is falling by the side, but we're still, I think, being productive. I think we're still being effective in a, a way that perhaps we wouldn't even have thought we could be beforehand. I mean, in the past, I know I've done work from, run calls from home, and I've done everything to protect those on the call from my home life. I mean, you know, a very short story on this one is what. Well, in the house I had, I had two uh, fairly young kids at the point. And they were coming home from school, and, and they knew that when I was on the phone, or I, I used to have regular calls with the US. So when they came home from school, I'd be sitting in the dining room, which had big glass doors. And it was near the front door. So when they came in, they knew you know, they had to be quiet because Daddy was on a conference call at this time. And one day they came in, and one of them waved at me. The second one walked into the first one. The, first, the second one turned around, hit the first one, and they were having a full-fledged fight in silence outside my room. But you know, the whole point of it is that there was a time you tried you tried to protect your working life and separate you completely. But now there's a lot of acceptance that we can still be successful and productive and efficient, and just letting life go on around us. I don't. Has other people had that experience in recent times? Silence will always be taken as agreement. Zarisov <laughs> is here from Serbia. Yes, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, Serbia, hi. Serbia. I want to go to Serbia soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yes, I had uh, that experience. So, it's uh, now it's completely acceptable and it's happening all the time. So, the, the kids are coming and bathing or dogs are in there or whatever is happening, so that's, that's not a problem, and we managed to, to finish our work as well, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absol absolutely, yeah. absolutely. There must, I don't know, if, they, if some of these big companies, have they got board meetings, do you think, they, do you think they're doing it in a relaxed way? I don't know, probably not. <laughs> that would be funny to listen to. <laughs> All right. So, any other thoughts on on this kind of working smarter and not harder? You know, I, you know, I want to I want these calls to run as long as they they they're useful, and we're not going to stretch them out. We're not going to say it has to be an hour. Um, and I've listened to the ones that other people have done, um, and I like the style. I mean, it it is a very relaxed conversation, like we were sitting around having a cup of coffee. But I mean, does anybody else who hasn't spoken up yet, um, and without me having to say their name, do anybody else connect a, a thought, a comment, uh, just a contribution? Well, Peter, this is Gerald. Can you hear me? Hi, Gerald. Hi. Hello. It was good, good to see you in February in Geneva. So, um, ah, yes. Although, although, although we didn't talk, but um, <laughs> just just got in in time. Yes. Indeed. And, yeah. And, and, and uh, your sponsorship co um, presentation was one of the best I've seen. So that was great. Thanks. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yes. And uh, yeah, that was a small room with lots of people in, and then that just wouldn't be allowed now, would it? Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, what's, uh, what's, what's what's your thought? Well, the the, the question is also. I mean, I, I have uh, both a PMO hat and I have an IT developer hat. So that was actually a, it's sometimes a very useful that uh, you know when there's something to automate, the laziness kicks in. Mm -hmm. Or you know, or reporting can be very boring, but unless you've automated it, you know, so made it made it lazy. So. Uh, uh, I was wondering, do you have any, um, do you have any like uh, templates or something, or or can that be uploaded, or do you have like a collection of uh, something like that? I mean, unfortunately, some of the work I've done, I'm, I'm not allowed outside the company, you know. But uh, um, 
I created like a macro uh, that is something you don't have as a problem as an English speaker, but uh, if you're in a, let's say, French-speaking environment, your Windows is set up on, in French, mm -hmm. but you have, for instance, to, uh, you, you have to set up, for instance, your uh, when you do your Stierco uh, slides, they're all in English, but uh, PowerPoint's not very smart, at least in version 2013, maybe it got better later. And so I created a little macro that set the um, language, the proofing language, to um, to English everywhere, so we actually catch catch all the typos. Oh, okay, yeah, that's yeah. a neat that's a neat trick. Yeah, well, I, yeah, yeah. Stico meetings and presentations or, or project the ones I've always found in experience of you know challenging because you know, when I ran the PMO, you know, we used to review hundreds of projects on a regular basis because we were, these were client facing projects, so we we had as many as we had clients and, and need. And it was always difficult to, you know, consolidate and, and standardize the, the project reporting. Because if you keep looking at, you know, this one's been reported in PowerPoint, this one's been reported in a kind of Word document, this one's in our Excel spreadsheet, this one's just a, you know, a bullet point on an email. You know, it, it's difficult to compare. So we created a very simple template um, for uh, regular project updates. And, you know, one of the one of the nicest tools we came across uh, during this time was a little PowerPoint add-in called Office Timeline, and it's just a, it's just a high-level schedule pres presenter really. But it was just in, it was exactly the right level of detail that when you're presenting to executives and uh, you know stakeholders and sponsors etc., it was a perfect level of detail. We looked behind that, of course, we had uh, more detailed tools. You know, whether it be Microsoft Project or whatever. But this was just a neat little tool that was a, a simple PowerPoint add-in, and we liked that. And, and actually, the project managers liked it as well, because one of the problems we always have with project managers is, well, I'm putting all my data into this system, but why do you want me to put it in a completely different format to do the regular reporting? It's duplication. It's not working smarter uh, at all. So we had to find a way of doing this. So, uh, yeah, that was one tip that we did have, etc. And, um, yeah, I mean, I have some, I have some uh, tools and some templates, which I'm happy to share. I mean, maybe, you know, on, on the forum, if you want to reach out to me and, and make that, you know, comment of something specific, I'll see if I can dig something out, and, and I'm happy to share. Hey, Peter, well, would it be you... possible to upload that in the group, for instance? Also? Yeah, 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 I think we can do that. I haven't, uh, we're, okay. we're, we're, we're all learning, but I believe it's, I think it's possible. And if it's not, then I can certainly find a way of getting it to you, no problem. Peter, can you tell us the name of that add-in again? Office Timeline. Thank you. Love yeah, no problem at all. No problem at all. So it's um, it does. I think the new version does two things. The old version just did the high level you know, kind of schedule, um, but the new version, I believe, actually does swim lanes as well, which I was quite excited to check. I know they sent me a license recently, and I haven't had time to actually yeah, play with it yet. Uh, I know uh, the guy who started the, started the company, and I did a bit of work for him. So yeah, yes, yes. Uh, oh yes. To be fair, you know, other other products are available. It's just I know this guy, and uh, we did do some work in the past. So I should say that for a complete openness on this front. But I did like I found the tool before I found the guy. So you know, that's that's it. That's that's it. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Who hasn't spoken? Who have I got to pick on? <laughs> I've, I've already spoken, but I had another question for you. Oh, go on, yeah, John, carry on. Yeah, uh, you know. You talk about the 80-20, and I totally agree. That's great. You know, I think we all do that in various aspects in our life. If you take the 20 that you're keyed on, is there an 80-20 of that, which is yes. the, key, the key thing from that that you've learned in all your experience in using the 80-20? <clears throat> there is, actually. When I wrote the book, I found the 80-20, obviously, and I, then I found the 80-20 twice, which is the 64-4 rule. And that does, mathematically, that is correct, and I couldn't even try to explain it now, but it is right. Um, I, you know, in the book, what I did was I, I summarized my summary onto kind of just two pages uh, of, of simple points of reference. So you can, you can distill things down. You know, my joke when I do presentations is you can buy those two pages, but it is the same price as the whole book. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Um, and actually, you don't have to read the whole book. You can skip straight to, straight to this chapter. Um, in personal practical life, I've never gone to that level of detail. But what I do have is a, a you know, it's, it's a simple tool. I use it in my training. Is I tell people that the first thing is you want to do, um, 
and this is maybe this is something that we can we can talk about next week, and I can just kind of showcase this. It's, it's very easy to do, but you know you you don't you know you know you like your risk. It's not you don't just have a risk and it's a number or whatever or red. You know there's some you know some working out workings that go behind it. Well, you know when it comes to priorities, you know the way I look at it is well if you consider how important something is and give it a score, and then you consider how what the impact of not doing it is and give that a score, and if you might flow those two things together, you've got a whole new ranking process that you can look at that actually does distill the most important things to the top. So whilst that's not the 80-20 rule twice, if you like, it is a way of ranking the things you've got to do. Um, and I'm more than happy to share that, and, and maybe we'll go through that next week. That's, a, that's, that's an idea. That sounds great. Thanks. Yeah? Okay. Well, there you go. That's giving me an idea for next week. That's me working smarter, not harder. That's just, you know, getting you to do the work. Yeah, well done, Peter. So I'm curious. We, we've talked a lot about the professional side of things, but I'm curious if I'm the only one on this call who has made the mistake of trying to be a lazy project manager with people in my personal life. <laughs> yeah. On the grounds that my partner is on this call at this precise moment in another room, I, I'm going to plead them whatever it is to, to not even answer <laughs> <laughs> Unless Juliet would like to make a comment at this point. <laughs> um, you know what? I, I was always told you you never try and project manage other people in your life in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't work. It doesn't work very well. No, no. And uh, no, you, you know, don't do a stakeholder assessment of your nearest and dearest, etc. It doesn't mean that some of the principles that are behind it all don't, don't apply, but you just don't make it obvious when you're doing it. <laughs> and that's all I'm saying on that. Anybody else can actually contribute. I don't mind. <laughs> did you did you raise that from personal experience, there, John? Oh gosh, yeah, right. The the times <laughs> I've been, hey, you know, there's a, there's a simpler, more efficient way to do this, and and I just can use the lazy approach and have that not go over well. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so surely somebody else has felt that. Well, I talk. I mean, it, it, you know, it's... conversation later. I'm sure. Oh, hello, <laughs> hello, my love. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm happy to talk on this call for as long as anybody wants now. Ah, <laughs> oh dear. No, 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 no. Um, I, do, I do tease a little bit when I, when I do one of my presentations. I talk about, I, when I, my kids were younger, I was on the Parents Teachers Association group. We sat on little tiny chairs you know, every other week. And we talked about things that were going on in the school. And, and I found it an interesting experience, but also a very frustrating experience because by the time you got to the year two of doing this, and typically you were on the PTA for a couple of years, by the time you got to year two, you were talking about the same things you were talked about a year ago. And you know, I realized quite quickly that the one thing I shouldn't do is stand up and go, and go hey, I'm a project manager and there is a much better way to do this. Let me tell you about it because it wouldn't have gone down well. But what I did say was, look, we do these big events every year, about three of them. So why don't we, you know, next, next time we do an event, let's just document it all and put it in a folder and, you know, do, I don't know, what should we call it at the end of it? Let's call it a kind of lessons learned, maybe, where we just talk about what worked, what didn't work, and how we can improve it for next time. And let's file it away. And then when the new group of people are there in a year's time, they've got a starting point. And that went down very well. But me standing up going, hey... I am the lazy project manager, and I can tell you how to be far more efficient. I think would have got a lot of um, cups of teas and cakes and stuff thrown at me, I'd imagine. So, yeah, be careful. Be careful. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Any other thoughts right now? No? Okay. Well, on that basis, um, again, call to action is, um, as I said, if you've liked uh, what other people have said, then please make sure you, f you friend them in within the tribe. If you like generally what's going on, please to reach out to all your colleagues outside of the tribe and, and invite them in. You know, we've still got the whole free trial thing going on. We're still learning our way. Um, the group forum is there. I will summarize this session uh, as best I can on the group forum tomorrow. But if you have any other comments or suggestions, then please uh, post some stuff on there to keep the conversation going. And I really hope that you're, you know, we get to get you on the call again in a week's time. And I just want to thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it.